Okay. Hello, everyone. A warm welcome to the fourth conference in the Modern Studies in the Law of Trusts and Wealth Management. This conference is Philanthropy in the Age of COVID-19, Asian and Global Perspectives. My name is Yip Man and I'm the Director of Singapore Management University Center for Commercial Law in Asia. We are very proud to be partnering University of York and the Asian Law Center at Melbourne Law School in the organization of this conference. On behalf of my co-conveners, Richard Lonan, Tang Hang Wu and Ying Liu, I thank everyone for joining us at this online conference. Before we kick off with the keynote presentation for day one, I will just go through a couple of housekeeping matters. There will be a 15 minute Q&A for the keynote after our keynote speaker, mm -hmm. Professor Matthew Harding's presentation. All participants may submit their questions for Matthew using the chat function at any time during the presentation. We have to adhere strictly to the time to ensure that our conference proceedings will end on time. Therefore, we may not be able to cover all questions raised during the q and I'll try my best to select questions that speak to a diverse range of themes or issues. Thank you. Now, allow me to introduce our day one keynote speaker, Professor Matthew Harding from the Melbourne Law School. Matthew really requires no introduction as he's an internationally recognized expert on private law and the law of charities and other not-for-profit organizations. He has published extensively in these areas, combining theoretical, doctrinal, and practical insights. His major monograph on the theoretical foundations of charity law and the liberal state was published in 2014 by Cambridge University Press. Matthew will be speaking to us on philanthropy, justice, and law today, a paper that looks, through, uh, that looks at current practices and future trends through the theoretical prism of justice. Without further ado, I hand over the time to Matthew. Matthew, please. Thanks very much, uh, Yipman. I'm going to share my screen because I have some slides to accompany my talk. Uh, so just bear with me a moment while I do that. Yipman, thanks so much for the welcome and thanks to the organisers for having me along. I'm just thrilled to be here. Um, here in Melbourne, of course, we're in COVID lockdown once again. And um, but I want to assure you that I'm far from isolated here in my uh, There are three generations of my family under the roof here with me, ranging in age from uh, seven to 74. Uh, I tell you this for two reasons. Uh, the first is that anything could happen in the background here during the course of my presentation, and I apologize for that in advance. Uh, secondly, uh, I'd just say that philanthropy, justice and even law are all called for in the Harding household this week as we manage our shared confinement. Um, to the paper then, uh, and I uh, start the proposition that philanthropy and justice uh, are in tension with each other. Uh, that's a, a, a claim that you see made not infrequently in literature. Today I want to explore several ways in which this tension might be observed in contemporary settings. Um, first, I want to consider the extent to which philanthropy, because it lacks coordination, might generate distributive outcomes that seem undesirable from the perspective of justice. Uh, secondly, I want to think about how philanthropy might entail discrimination that offends norms, uh, anti-discrimination norms grounded in the demands of justice. Uh, thirdly, uh, I want to explore the idea that philanthropy might enable the rich to enjoy a disproportionate share of political power. Uh, and finally, I want to examine whether philanthropy expresses relational equality or inequality between citizens uh, that if offends justice, irrespective of distributive outcomes. Um, I'll conclude with some brief general reflections on philanthropy, justice and the role of the state. Um, so let me start then with my first theme, uh, philanthropy and the problem of uncoordinated distributive outcomes. Um, many accounts of distributive justice, including leading accounts in the liberal philosophical tradition, are concerned primarily with ensuring that desired distributive outcomes are achieved across society. From such perspective, lack of coordination in the mechanisms by which resources or other goods are distributed may well be cause for concern. This is because lack of coordination might make it relatively difficult to secure distributive outcomes that are characterised in the right sort of way. A centralised and planned approach to distribution can keep in view principles of distributive justice and aim at outcomes that conform to the principles in question. A diffuse and unplanned approach cannot readily do this. On this view, 
philanthropy seems susceptible to criticism because as the product of individual motivations and actions, it may well have an uncoordinated character. A striking example of the phenomenon, uh, oh, sorry, of the problem in practice emerged in early 2020 in Australia. Uh, the summer of 2019-2020 will long be remembered in Australia because of the catastrophic bushfires that ravaged much of the eastern side of the continent. A at the height of the bushfire season, an Australian comedian and actor called Celeste Barber launched a fundraising appeal on Facebook in the following terms. She wrote, uh, please help, this is terrifying. I'm raising money for the trustee for New South Wales Rural Fire Service and Brigades Donations Fund, and your contribution will make an impact. Ms Barber's appeal had an initial fundraising goal of 30,000 Australian dollars, but by the time the appeal closed, over $50 million had been donated by some 1.3 million donors from around the world. Ms Barber did not consult with the trustees of the Rural Fire Service, which I'll call RFS for convenience, uh, before launching her fundraising appeal. The appeal might fairly be characterised as a spontaneous act of altruism on her part. Similarly, the donors who responded to the appeal acted individually, each one expressing their own sentiments and motivations on the Facebook platform at the time of making their donation. This lack of coordination in the way that $51 million were raised presented a problem for the trustees of RFS once the donations were paid over to it via an intermediary trust. RFS is a charitable trust its trustees are bound by the terms of its trust deed to apply its assets to its articulated charitable purposes. The purposes of RFS focus on enabling or assisting fire brigades in the state of New South Wales. The $51 million raised by Ms Barber's appeal and paid to the trustees of RFS were clearly appropriately expended on those purposes under the terms of the trust. However, Ms Barber least some of the donors to her appeal and sections of the Australian media indicated a desire that some of the $51 million be expended on other purposes as well. For example, helping other charities, helping fire services in states of Australia other than New South Wales, and helping people and animals affected by bushfires. After all, in early 2020, there was great need in all these areas across the whole east coast of Australia. And $51 million is a lot of money to be expended on the purposes of a single charity with a relatively confined mandate. The trustees of RFS sought judicial advice on what they could spend the $51 million on consistent with the charitable purposes of RFS. The response of Justice Slattery in the New South Wales Supreme Court is instructive when thinking about the resources available within law to address the problem of philanthropy and uncoordinated distributive outcomes. Uh, one mechanism in charity law that might be thought pertinent to this sort of case is the CPRA scheme, enabling trust assets to be applied to purposes analogous but not identical to those for which they were settled. However, Justice Slattery noted that a CPRA scheme was not sought in this case, uh, as all of $51 million uh, could be applied in furtherance of the purposes of RFS. Uh, CPRE variation is apposite in circumstances where there is some impediment to applying assets to purposes, not when the distributive implications of doing so might be viewed as suboptimal or unwelcome. Uh, now that said, I note the discussion of this aspect of the RFS case by Joanne Murray in her paper for this conference, and it's an excellent paper. Uh, she, she suggests there that the CPRA uh, question may not have been as straightforward as Justice Slattery thought. In the end, though, Justice Slattery concluded that with minor exceptions, the RFS trustees could not expend any part of the $51 million on fire services outside New South Wales or on helping people or animals other than firefighters in New South Wales affected by bushfires. The result of Justice Slattery's advice in the RFS case, $51 million raised for bushfire disaster relief may now be expended only on the purposes of RFS. Uh, in the absence of further study, 
We can't say to what extent the distributive implications of this might be of concern in light of applicable principles of justice. Nonetheless, some questions might be asked. To the extent that disaster relief for people affected by the bushfires has been insufficient to meet needs, has law failed to match the 51 million philanthropically raised with distributive outcomes that are desired or even mandated in light of principles of justice? Uh, another question, the New South Wales government and municipal councils in that state are required under statute to fund rural fire services on a quarterly basis. Uh, if this funding is now reduced because of the philanthropy employed by RFS, do distributive concerns arise to the extent that the tax and ratepayers of New South Wales are subsidised by charitable donors from other states and countries? Uh, would the uncoordinated philanthropy on display in Ms Barber's appeal compare favourably to more coordinated state-sponsored initiatives, such as direct government assistance to disaster-affected citizens? I raised these questions, uh, but I won't attempt to answer them here. Instead, uh, I'll turn now to my uh, second topic, which is philanthropy and the problem of discrimination. Uh, one of the great justice projects of the 20th and now 21st centuries has been the imposition of uh, equality norms uh, with a non-discrimination focus uh, onto the affairs of political communities. These norms prohibit discrimination against members of groups defined with reference to articulated human identity, ranging from religious belief to sex, to sexual orientation, to disability. In countries where liberal political commitments inform law and policy, norms enjoining discrimination usually figure in public law, constraining action on the part of the state and to some extent, other actors where they perform state functions. Uh, much less clear has been the question of the application of non-discrimination norms to private action. Uh, how non-discrimination norms uh, that are at large in public life should affect philanthropy is a difficult question. Philanthropy is in one sense private action in that it entails the owners of private property exercising their use freedoms to dispose of that property as they see fit. However, in another sense, philanthropy has a public character as it is usually, although not always, uh, directed to the furtherance of public benefit purposes and it is not infrequently administered by intermediary institutions. Universities might be offered as a good example that perform public functions or that enjoy some degree of state support. Where philanthropy entails discrimination then, how should law respond given philanthropy's hybrid character as both private and public? In several leading cases, judges have sought to respond using the general law tool of public policy. Uh, perhaps the best known example is the 1996 decision of the Ontario Court of Appeal in INRI Canada Trust Company and Ontario Human Rights Commission. Colonel Reuben Wells, Leonard, was a prominent Canadian who had made a fortune in mining. He had a strong philanthropic drive, leading him to make substantial gifts for a variety of public purposes. Among these, was the Leonard Foundation, a trust established to fund educational scholarships. It was and remains one of the largest providers of such scholarships in Canada. The recitals and the provisions of the trust deed reflected Colonel Leonard's worldview. Among other things, the scholarships were to be restricted to white Protestants of British nationality or parentage. The quantum of scholarship funds to be paid to women was restricted and the trust terms also discriminated against other candidates on grounds of parental occupation. When the Leonard Foundation was first established early in the 20th century, the discriminatory trust terms were arguably in alignment with prevailing practices in Canada. However, by the late 20th century, the trustees of the Leonard Foundation were under intense public scrutiny and pressure because of their continued adherence to those trust terms the trustees applied to the court for judicial advice. At first instance, they were advised that the Leonard Foundation did not offend public policy. However, on appeal, the Ontario Court of Appeal made orders 
to remove from the terms that discriminated on grounds of race, sex, nationality and religion. For the court, Canadian public policy clearly enshrined non-discrimination norms and such norms were applicable in the law of trusts as well as in public law. A majority of the court reasoned in terms suggesting that non-discrimination norms might apply to trusts in Canada generally, while Justice Tarnopolsky in a separate concurring judgment was careful to limit his reasoning to charitable trusts because of their distinctive public character. Justice Tarnopolsky's view has been affirmed in subsequent Canadian cases. Judicial responses to philanthropy and the problem of discrimination are not limited to cases in which courts are asked to work out the demands of general law public policy. They may also arise in public law. Consider the 2020 case of Crown on the application of Z and another and Hackney London Borough Council and another. A charitable housing association, AIHA, owned some 470 properties in Hackney in London. The purpose of AIHA was to provide housing to those in need, with a primary focus on the Orthodox Jewish community of Hackney. Under an arrangement with the council, AIHA made housing available to council approved social housing applicants, and the council placed Orthodox Jewish applicants with AIHA in accordance with AIHA's charitable purpose. A single mother with four small children, two of whom had autism, had applied to the Council for Social Housing and discovered that Orthodox Jewish families were placed in AIHA housing ahead of her, even though she had been identified by the Council as a priority case and as requiring the sort of housing that AIHA provided. This applicant then went to court, asserting that AIHA had discriminated against her on grounds of religion, and that this was unlawful under provisions of the Equality Act of 2010. In the United Kingdom Supreme Court, AIHA's discrimination on grounds of religion was found to be lawful. The court first considered section 158 of the Equality Act, which permits discrimination on grounds of religious belief in circumstances where that discrimination satisfies a proportionality test. The court found that AIHA's aim when allocating its housing, uh, the aim of alleviating disadvantage suffered by London's Orthodox Jewish community, was a legitimate aim. Moreover, its policy of allocating all available housing to members of the Orthodox Jewish community to the exclusion of other applicants was found to be a proportionate means of achieving that legitimate aim once the benefits of to the Orthodox Jewish community of um, AIHA's practices were weighed against the disadvantages experienced by other groups as a result, and once the limited resources available to AIHA in working out how best to achieve its legitimate aim were properly taken into account. The Court 93, subsection 2 of the Equality Act, which permits a charity to discriminate on grounds of religion in order to prevent or compensate for disadvantage linked to being a member of a certain religion. The court found that in order to avail itself of the protection of this provision, a charity is not required to satisfy a proportionality test. It is sufficient that the discrimination in view addresses historic disadvantage. Now, an interesting understanding of philanthropy and its relation to the demands of justice emerges from a close reading of the court's judgment in Zed and Hackney Council. In finding that charities tackling historic disadvantage by targeting benefits at particular groups need not justify their actions by showing proportionality, the court emphasised that charities must demonstrate public benefit in order to achieve registration and that it is the role of the state, not charities, to ensure sufficient social welfare provision to members of the community. Putting this differently, the court seemed to suggest that the philanthropists behind AIHA should be free to target their gifts to needy Orthodox Jewish people, 
And if at the same time, housing is unavailable to other needy people, it is for the state to explain this injustice. In Zed and Hackney Council then, reflection on the problem of discrimination leads to a set of further questions about the division of labour between the state and the charity sector in the achievement of distributive justice generally. This vision of the state bearing the burden of distributive justice through the provision of social welfare and philanthropy supplementing state provision according to the convictions and preferences of philanthropists is an attractive one. Nonetheless, in a society where the state fails to discharge its responsibility to make adequate provision for the worst off, is it appropriate that this vision inform legal responses to injustice in philanthropic settings? The single mother in Zed and Hackney Council had been placed by the council into suitable housing by the time the case got to the United Kingdom Supreme Court. But what if this had not happened and she had ended up homeless? If the state fails to ensure the minimum of social welfare for all, then perhaps it is arguable that judges should reject a vision that allows philanthropists to make their contributions according to their own lights. Instead, perhaps judges should attempt to generate from the patchwork of philanthropic provision on offer, a simulacrum of what the state ought to but does not provide. I'll return to those thoughts at the end of my presentation. Let, let me now turn to the third of my four topics, which is philanthropy and the distribution of political power. The idea that the rich should enjoy disproportionate political power compared with other members of the political community is repugnant to just about any defensible conception of justice. To the extent that philanthropy enables this then, it ought to be a matter of great concern. In recent years, much has been written about the political influence exercised by extremely wealthy philanthropists, Bill and Melinda Gates, George Soros, Mark Zuckerberg, to name just a few. In order to assess the extent to which such claims of plutocracy have merit, it is worth pausing to dwell on the precise legal mechanisms by which philanthropists come to enjoy political power. Such inquiry rightly begins with tax preferments. Philanthropists, at least where their gifts are directed at state approved purposes, typically enjoy tax preferments in respect of those gifts. For example, a donor might be able to deduct from her assessable income in the relevant period the amount of the gift, potentially reducing her assessable income to zero, depending on the quantum of the gift. Such a deduction might be conceptualized in different ways, but in substance, it amounts to a contribution by the state of revenue raised from other taxpayers to further the purposes for which the donor made her gift. The is able to direct the expenditure of revenue to her chosen purposes and thereby exercises political power separate from the democratic and representative institutions of government through which the whole political community collectively decides how to spend revenue in the ordinary course of events. And while it is true that donors generally are able to enjoy this sort of power over expenditure of the revenue, rich donors possess more of this power as they tend to direct larger expenditures. Moreover, and this is a critical point, in jurisdictions with a progressive income tax, rich donors possess a disproportionate amount of political power when they claim deductions because deductions have a perverse regressive effect that mirrors the progressive character of the income tax. So the inquiry into tax preferments quickly leads, at least in the case of deductions, to real concerns about philanthropy and the distribution of political power. The regressive effects of the deduction might be dealt with by the state adopting other mechanisms to encourage philanthropy. For example, the tax credit, which does not have a regressive effect, is used in Canada, and at least for taxpayers who are natural persons, New Zealand, to take two jurisdictions. Nonetheless, the underlying concern remains. Where rich philanthropists make large gifts, they direct the expenditure of revenue in ways that afford them a substantial, even if not disproportionate, degree of political power. <clears throat> 
at this point in the analysis, bigger questions come into view. How did rich philanthropists get so rich in the first place? Have they carried a just share of the tax burden apart from their philanthropic activities? While the question of what distributive justice demands of a tax system is notoriously difficult, it seems hard to believe that current settings in most of the tax systems of the world today meet even a minimal set of demands. Indeed, Bill Gates himself has said publicly that extremely rich people should pay more tax. In short, to the extent that wealthy philanthropists enjoy substantial political power because of their philanthropic activities, it might have more to do with the fact that they are wealthy and less to do with the fact that they are philanthropists. At the same time as concerns about philanthropy and plutocracy might turn out to be less about philanthropy and more about underlying concentrations of wealth, it is possible to construct a narrative in which the value of philanthropy is located, at least in part, in its very potential as a means for exercising political power. Elements of such a, a positive narrative are spelled out, for example, in the work of Robert Reich, who argues that philanthropy is a vehicle for political contributions from a diverse and decentralized range of voices and associations in society, and a site for experimentation that is untethered by the usual accountabilities attached to state action. Such philosophical reflections, which find their origin in thinkers like John Stuart Mill, find their counterpart in jurisprudential developments. Since the early part of the 20th century, charity law in many jurisdictions has raised obstacles in the path of the philanthropist who seeks to support political purposes. A trust to promote law reform or changes to government policy or advocacy for a particular point of view on a contested social issue has been refused charity status. Recently, however, in the 2010 case of Aidwatch and the Federal Commissioner of Taxation, a majority of the High Court of Australia found that an entity formed for the purpose of generating public debate about foreign aid delivery was a charity pursuing a public benefit purpose. In doing so, the majority reasoned that the furtherance of political purposes by not-for-profit associations might contribute to a culture of free political expression on which representative and responsible government under the Australian constitution depends. A similar development may be playing out in New Zealand jurisprudence, although the extent to which this is so will turn on the outcome of a case currently before New Zealand's Supreme Court. Now, I think that an account that celebrates the contributions that philanthropy can make to politics assumes the existence of a certain sort of charity sector. And this brings us back to underpinning questions of wealth inequality. The vision of philanthropy generating a diversity of innovative and independent viewpoints on questions of government and policy is one that seems most easily realized by a multitude of relatively modest associations and entities operating in accordance with their own preferences, convictions, and beliefs. Such a scene may be contrasted with a civil society dominated by the interests and agendas of a few rich philanthropists. In the latter picture, diversity is likely to be hampered as the voices of smaller, more modestly resourced organizations are drowned out. Innovation might also suffer as organizations funded by the rich achieve scale and consequently grow bureaucratic and inflexible. Even independence might be compromised as wealthy donors shy away from projects and purposes that might complicate their political aspirations or connections. Once again, the point that emerges is that in the world where plutocrats enjoy political power through their philanthropic activities, the problem to be addressed is not so much the practice of philanthropy itself as the concentrations of wealth that plutocrats enjoy in the first place. Now, my fourth topic is the problem of philanthropy expressing relationships of inequality. My starting point here is a conception of justice that is interested not in desired distributive states, 
but rather in the affective and cognitive dimensions of social relationships. Uh, thus, in one influential treatment of egalitarian justice, Elizabeth Anderson argues for a conception of equality as, and I quote, a relationship among people rather than merely as a pattern in the distribution of divisible goods. This helps us to see how egalitarians can take other features of society besides the distribution of goods, such as social norms, as subject to critical scrutiny. It lets us see how injustices may be better remedied by changing social norms and the structure of public goods than by redistributing resources. That's Anderson's words. From a justice perspective that is centrally interested in relationships of equality, philanthropy may well be viewed as problematic. Back in the 1920s, British thinker and politician Clement Attlee alluded to the problem, arguing that the beneficiaries of charity are demeaned by their passive role in the transaction from which they benefit. For Attlee, people who seek to help others without demeaning them ought to pay taxes that may then be redistributed to those in need as their entitlement from the state. When assessing arguments that philanthropy situates people in unequal relationships of concern from the perspective of justice, several considerations seem relevant. One is the extent to which a philanthropist deals directly with those who benefit from her philanthropy. Where relationships between philanthropists and their beneficiaries are mediated by third parties or interposed structures or practices, the presence of those mediating factors might diffuse concerns about the relationships in question being equal. Consider a wealthy philanthropist who funds a bursary to support a student from a poor family. Now imagine that a lunch is organised to celebrate this philanthropist and the recipient of the bursary attends, feels obliged to show gratitude to the philanthropist at the lunch table and is proudly displayed to all the philanthropist's rich friends. It is not hard to imagine the student in question being demeaned in this setting. Now imagine that the philanthropist chooses not to engage directly with the recipient of the bursary, but instead leaves it to an intermediary organisation, perhaps a university, to handle the bursary and deal with the recipient according to its usual administrative processes. Now the opportunity for the recipient to be demeaned by the act of philanthropy seems diminished. This point about mediated philanthropy seems generalizable. Much philanthropy does not look like an analog of a rich pedestrian handing money to a beggar in a demeaning transaction on the street. Rather, it entails foundations or trusts themselves separate from if controlled by the philanthropists that set them up, or even individual people making grants to operational charities and other not-for-profit organisations, which in turn provide services to beneficiaries, often in exchange for a fee. Another consideration that seems relevant to the argument that philanthropy expresses relationships of inequality is the destination of philanthropic largesse. Philanthropy by which advantaged people extend benefits to disadvantaged people seems susceptible to the charge of relational inequality. This is because thanks to prevailing social and cultural conditions, it's plausible that such philanthropy might express the sorts of motivations, attitudes and beliefs that help to constitute unequal relationships. Philanthropy motivated by pity might be given as an example. However, much philanthropy does not follow this pattern of advantaged people benefiting the disadvantaged. Indeed, at least in the USA, data suggests that the causes favoured by wealthy philanthropists tend not to focus on benefiting the disadvantaged and instead concentrate on the arts, tertiary education and healthcare. These are all purpose types from which the wealthy themselves stand to benefit. If anything is expressed by such philanthropy, it is likely to be self-interest. Now, it might be objected that self-interest is an unpalatable motivation for philanthropy. I certainly do not dissent from that view. Nonetheless, the objection does not establish 
that in cases where philanthropy is self-interested, it situates people in relationships of inequality. Philanthropy is suspect in light of the demands of relational equality when philanthropists engage with beneficiaries in a morally problematic way, causing beneficiaries to conceive of their own position in the relationship in a way that demeans them. None of this necessarily occurs where philanthropists act from self-interest. Indeed, the self-interested philanthropist may not think about the beneficiaries of her bounty at all. What then does relational equality demand of the ethical philanthropist? We should take care here not to unthinkingly adopt an excessively rigorous view of what relational equality requires. For while it seems plausible that philanthropy by which advantaged people benefit disadvantaged people is susceptible to the charge of relational inequality, this need not inevitably be the case. Anderson herself recognises this fact when she discusses the virtue of compassion and how it might animate concern for and action to benefit the disadvantaged that does not offend the demands of relational equality. There seems no reason to think that a diversity of approaches cannot be deployed when treating others on a footing of equality. This thought echoes a line of argument that I introduced earlier. A large part of the value of philanthropy might lie in precisely its capacity to enable the expression of a range of altruistic virtues and to foster plurality in social life. Let, let me now say something in closing about the role of the state. One lesson that emerges from what I've covered so far is that in order to arrive at a sense of how philanthropy might support justice goals, it might be necessary to have an accompanying sense of the state's proper responsibilities in pursuing such goals. In a paper recently published in the journal Legal Theory, Dan Halliday and I have argued that such an account of the state's responsibilities should be sensitive not only to the ways in which the state is well placed to pursue justice, say because of its monopoly on legitimate coercion and its scale, but also to the distinctive value of the charity sector as a site for the expression of a multiplicity of virtues and modes of interaction. The general picture that Halliday and I argue for is one in which the state provides a baseline of social welfare and public goods that accords with the demands of social of justice, freeing up philanthropists to pursue their own conceptions of the good relatively unencumbered by what justice requires. The ideal world might be one in which the state carries its share of the justice burden, leaving philanthropists to pursue a range of conceptions of the good in a plurality of ways. However, where, as appears increasingly to be the case, we fall short of the ideal world because the state refuses to carry its justice burden, then it might be appropriate to hold philanthropists to account from a justice standpoint, especially where they control vast concentrations of wealth. Moreover, ethical philanthropists might respond appropriately to that challenge by choosing to pursue justice as opposed to other worthy goals. The resulting social scene might be one in which justice goals are achieved to a greater extent than would be the case if philanthropists were not held to and activated by the demands of justice. Nonetheless, that dividend in terms of justice might come at a considerable cost paid in the currency of liberal values such as diversity, independence and innovation. Ironically then, for liberals at least, there seem to be good arguments for the state to pursue justice that have little to do with what justice itself requires and much more to do with how to sustain and nourish other values. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, um, Matthew, yeah, for the very um, insightful presentation. Uh, we, I have received two questions uh, from attendees, uh, perhaps too shy to show who they are. So I'll now cut and paste the question in the chat function for everyone to see.
and I also repeat um, over the microphone. So this is the first question. And then we have a second question. Yes, yeah, so in the case of Celeste Barber, uh, can't the donee disclaim the gift and the court can then just use the excess money CPRA? Uh, and the bigger question according to this attendee is basically whether the trustee of the, tr the charities can disclaim a gift um, it is, if it is more than what they can use and hopefully um, the step of disclaiming the gift can be actually done with the blessing of the charity commissioner. So Matthew. Thanks. Um, so in this case, um, the RFS trustees had um, accepted the gift and um, on that basis, they then sought advice as to how they could best um, uh, deploy it. Um, the, the question of what donees might be able to do on the facts of this case is a very interesting one. I didn't go into it in my presentation, but um, it is nonetheless uh, interesting. So if we think about how individual donors were situated here, they're on Facebook, they see a message from Celeste Barber, they click through to a site where they can make their donation, um, and it's, it's done, you know, with a click of a you know, click of an iPad or an iPhone, um, the donation is then um, uh, received by um, a trustee occupying an intermediary role, uh, uh, which was a trustee uh, within the PayPal uh, organisation. So, um, and there was an arrangement with Facebook and PayPal, um, uh, which facilitated that. So, the the donations from the individual people received by the PayPal trustee, which holds them pursuant to a, a charitable trust, uh, and the charitable trust uh, say that the PayPal trustee uh, will in the ordinary course of events pay out those donations to the beneficiary nominated by the donors. Um, but the PayPal trustee has uh, a, a discretion uh, uh, and in that discretion, it may be possible for the PayPal trustee to distribute the donations to uh, other uh, organisations. Um, nonetheless, um, the PayPal trustee in this case just hands over the whole 51 million to the RFS trustees. Um, if you go back to the point at which the donors were making their gifts, uh, there seems to be good evidence in this case that uh, different donors thought they were giving to different things. And uh, not all of them thought they were actually giving to the Royal F uh, Rural Fire Service of New South Wales, uh, even though that was um, explicitly stated to be the, the nominated beneficiary uh, on Facebook at the point where the donations were made. And, and the evidence to suggest that it was more complex are uh, that when donors were making gifts, they were entering notes in Facebook to go along with those gifts. You know, this is for the animals, this is to save the koalas, this is for the people in Victoria, etc., etc. So you have this very complex picture when it comes to donor intention. And, uh, and I think that then opens up an interesting set of questions about how donors might claw back their gifts in the event that they see the funds going to a purpose for which they actually did not intend the funds to go. It raises very difficult questions about um, how you actually work out the intention of donors at the point of giving. Um, do you take them to be held by what was explicitly stated on Facebook, in which case their, their intention is, objectively speaking, the money goes to the RFS Trust? Uh, or do you take into account the notes that they entered at the time of making their donations as individuals? And if you enter down that path, how do you? Um, how do you balance in the interpretive exercise uh, the, that evidence of uh, individual intentions uh, and the and the uh, nominated beneficiary being stated to be RFS? Um, when the case got to Justice Slattery, there is one part of his advice where he he uh, acknowledges that donors might, depending on their circumstances, have claims to recover uh, their gifts. Presumably he's thinking of some sort of quiz close type um, uh, claim, um, but he doesn't spell it out in any detail. Um, and of course it would turn on the circumstances of each individual gift. Typically we're making pretty small gifts 
uh, they're not necessarily incentivized to get to court and try and argue for recovery of the gift. Um, so yes, the case, there, there are very difficult and interesting questions about and the intermediary trustee as well. Thank you. Uh, we have two more questions in the chat, if you can read them, uh, I've uh, cut a paste from attendees who sent them to me. So they speak to basically the three themes that you um, discuss in your presentation. Now, the first one is, uh, since a lot of charities in Asia is clan or religious based, when does it shade into discrimination or an effort to help your own clan and community, right? Is it a bad mm. thing? Yeah. So it's really interesting. Um, and I'm not an expert on the theory or law of discrimination, so I can only speak around the edges of that. But we do see um, all sorts of discrimination in the charity um, area. Some of it is clearly egregious and bigoted, but not much. Okay, um, even the Leonard Foundation Trust, which to our eyes today looks like a pretty unacceptable um, arrangement founded on notions of racial and religious superiority, uh, was not viewed in that way uh, 100 years ago when the, the trust was set up. Um, uh, and so, um, but, but I think that's close to the end of the scale where discrimination uh, is looking pretty questionable and something that needs to be addressed with public policy imperatives in view. Of course, the much more commonplace uh, instances of discrimination in philanthropic settings are exactly as the question suggests, motivated out of a sense of solidarity or loyalty, um, or a desire to that might have been disadvantaged historically, or with which the donor um, has a particular affinity or interest. Um, and indeed, the Jewish Housing Association case can be given as an excellent example of that. Um, the desire there was not to shut out people because they weren't Orthodox Jews. The desire there was to help Orthodox Jews. Um, so at some point, the law has to find uh, a line between uh, the, the bigoted discrimination that does clearly offend public policy and the more um, benign forms of discrimination. And you do see that in some of the cases. So I, I, I didn't go into the Canadian cases that came after the Leonard Foundation case, but there have been a few uh, in which the, the parameters of the reasoning in the Leonard Foundation case have been tested. And they've been cases where you've seen discriminatory trusts um, trying to um, provide benefits to people who have been historically excluded from tertiary education, for example, um, uh, or um, people who have the same religious background as the, as the donor. And the Canadian courts have upheld those arrangements and they've drawn a distinction between those and the trust uh, in the Leonard Foundation case. Um, so it's a hard question, but but there is a, a line to be drawn there, and courts do try to draw it. Thank you. Um, then the next question is uh, the attendee is wondering whether you have any ideas on political influence in the real imperfect world of essentially unchallenged plutocracy. A very complex question, packed into a few. <laughs> <laughs> um, well. I think I go back to the point that I made in the presentation, which is that when we're thinking about um, the problems of plutocracy as they find expression in philanthropic settings, um, I think we are driven back to deeper anterior problems um, that uh, will be present whether or not very rich people engage in philanthropic activity. Um, so, uh, you know, another way of putting that is to say, and I, I sort of said it in the paper, um, we can worry about giving tax preferments to very rich people who donate money to charitable causes. Um, and we can find and policy um, bandwidth trying to solve that problem. Uh, or we can move further back the line and ask the question, well, um, 
do we want to be living in a society where this tiny uh, cohort of people controls such vast concentrations of capital, enjoys such enormous uh, incomes, um, uh, and uh, and pay uh, taxes in respect of wealth and their income um, that seem far lower than what the demands of justice might require. So I'm suggesting you push the inquiry down the line where it becomes a much harder inquiry to, you know, it's easy to have a local debate about whether um, you have a deduction or a tax credit for philanthropic giving. It's much harder to ask the question whether billionaires should be paying much higher rates of tax. Um, so I guess that's where I'd land on that. Thank you. Um, there's then a very broad question uh, from one of the attendees. Does the large role of charity ultimately not come down to a relatively narrow conception of the Anglo-American state in the 19th century? Um, just wondering how sites may apply to a larger continental European state, so onshore Asian states such as China, Japan, but the state already exercises um, the social role that you suggested, right, providing baseline welfare. Uh, in other words, are these considerations of charity law peculiarly Anglo-American in their historical development? Yeah, I love that question. They are. Um, and so I think um, what I've said in my presentation um, has to be um, has to be understood as speaking to that uh, tradition and that set of political, um, moral, intellectual commitments that come out of the Anglo-American tradition. Um, how the points that I made in the presentation play out in uh, political communities which are organised on other bases is a question I'm certainly not expert to answer, but I will be able in this conference who are much more expert than I. Um, so I do definitely see the work that I've sort of been doing in this space as within a certain tradition, political and legal tradition. And I certainly see Chang Law uh, as, as an expression of very particular political and intellectual commitments that arguably belong to um, the history and culture of Western Europe um, and, and other states that have a colonial heritage informed by Western European thought. You see it in Australia and in New Zealand um, uh, coming up uh, when the um, activities and purposes of Indigenous communities ought to be determined according to Anglo-Australian charity law. Um, to take one good example, the public benefit requirement that is at the heart of charity law, or Anglo-Australian charity law, um, can't be satisfied easily where um, purposes stand to benefit uh, a group that is connected by kinship ties. Um, and I know that there are Asian jurisdictions where this same problem has arisen historically and um, at least in colonial times, courts struggled and have gradually freed themselves of the struggle as time has gone on. And you see the same thing happening in Australia and New Zealand. But in freeing yourself of the struggle, you develop a charity law that is now um, departing from some of the, um, some of the commitments that, that come out of it. Arguably a very British conception of um, what it means to benefit others and even what the other is. Um, different conception of altruism, to put it another way. Um, yes, thank you. So if I may also just abuse my position as the chair of your presentation, then to ask a follow on question, uh, which is that, you know, if for these states, um, European states or the onshore Asian states mentioned by um, the attendee, uh, already provide a baseline level of benefit, then the corresponding responsibility on charities to do that, right, would be reduced, would that be a logical implication of your argument, right? Um, in that sense, therefore, uh, the charities can choose projects that are, in your words, more diverse or innovative, or perhaps in reality to be, in that sense, more discriminatory, not necessarily in a bad way. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that's right. So. Um... I think I think we have to hold in our in our minds both the, the the question of what the state is 
doing and the question of what um, charities and philanthropists might be doing. And um, you could, I mean, as we know, different states and societies, um, different states uh, take very different approaches to the provision of welfare and, and public goods. Um, and even with individual states, you see changes happening on that front over the course of time. Um, and so I think what we might expect of charities and philanthropists will have to change and be tailored to what the state is doing. And that will be different from one jurisdiction to another, and it will be different across time. So it's a dynamic and constantly changing sort of inquiry. Um, but as a general rule, I think that um, philanthropy and, and the charity sector, um, their potential can be where you have state settings that look a certain way. And I think that sort of, it, that would entail some basic minimal provision of social welfare, some basic commitment to education in order to ensure that the community remains coherent and integrated and peaceful across time. Uh, some ongoing concern with the position of the worst off and some, some mechanism for redistributing resources mm -hmm. um, to, to, to support those activities. I think where you see that, um, then you're likely to be looking at conditions where all else being equal, philanthropists can, can flourish. But of course, that, that then turns on, there are a number of other questions there which have to do with um, how the philanthropic and charitable sector looks. And as, as we've discussed, there might be pathologies there too, where you have a handful of mega, mega rich people who just control civil society. It's not a good, you know, you, you, you wouldn't be able to unlock the potential of the charity sector in those sense if you had a state that was looking after the worst off. Thank you, Matthew. Um, we have just one final question in the chat box. Perhaps you could just, uh quickly answer that, right? So it's a broad question. When it comes to imposing legal restrictions on philanthropy to meet requirements of justice where the state is said to fail to meet those requirements, to what extent is that instead an issue of competing views of what justice requires in the first place? Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> um, so what I've tried to do in the paper is I've tried to just um, I haven't settled on a particular vision of justice and then run that across all the different problems that I've discussed. Because as the question rightly points out, there are a range of different um, accounts of what justice requires and, um, and even different accounts of uh, what sorts of questions justice should be especially concerned with. Um, and I, I didn't want to have to take a view on any of that. So instead, what I tried to do was um, pick out some um, some questions um, that uh, that would at least to some minds look concerning from a justice standpoint. And that was enough to motivate the paper, at least I hoped it was. Um, but I think the question is right. Um, if we want to get to the point of really um, getting beyond the exploratory stage, which is what my paper is, 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 it's in that, I think it's at that stage, if we want to get beyond that to some sort of worked out and coherent account of how philanthropy uh, figures in uh, what Rawls might have called the well-ordered society, the society in which justice is pursued and in which all other sort of um, social arrangements um, are consistent with the demands of justice and so on, then I think we probably do need to come to some sort of um, understanding of what we think justice uh, demands. We need, we need to be working with principles of justice and that takes us into a whole different territory. Um, so I hope my, my paper's raised questions, but I don't think it's probably answered any. <laughs> I think it has answered plenty. Thank you so much, Matthew, and thank you for all the questions that uh, have come in. Uh, I'll bring this session to a close. We now have a 15 minute break. Uh, may I just remind the chair and speakers for the next session to come back maybe a few minutes before the next session begins to just check that you know your 
camera and everything is working. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. Thanks.